to spend some time with us here today and talk about the article, and we've also invited some people, uh, other experts, to comment on the issues raised in that article. My role is, is to introduce the person who's going to introduce them, uh, and uh, aside from welcoming you to uh, Stanford Law School, and I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bill Abrams, who's a, a partner at King and Spalding, uh, and uh, Bill is a, a great friend of the law school as well as the university, teaches several courses ranging a gamut from sex and the law to uh, uh, images of law and justice in the cinema to law and technology and sciences at the, uh, at the college and also at the law school. Uh, he's a member of our distinguished uh, advisory forum for the Center on the Legal Profession. So I'll get out of the way here, and uh, thanks very much, Bill. Thank you, George. Well, thank you for coming on our Friday afternoon, and uh, we have an incredible panel. Uh, this got started in my discussions with uh, Deborah Rohde, and then when Lucy joined uh, about uh, Noam's article and Steve's uh, great work, and uh, so we've got a great panel. And thanks again to the Center for sponsoring this and bringing everybody out here. So let me introduce our great panelists. First, let's start with Noam. Noam is a senior editor for the New Republic. He's a Rhodes Scholar, has a master's degree in economics from Oxford and a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Tulane. In addition to being a senior editor at the New Republic, uh, he's contributed to many other places, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, he has a book that came out last year, The Escape Artist, How Obama's Team Fumbled the Recovery. Uh, and he's chosen incredibly interesting topics to uh, investigate and write about, and one of them is big law. And we'll uh, get to know him in a moment. Uh, also here is my uh, good friend, Steve Harper. Steve was a partner and a lawyer at Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago for approximately 30 years. Uh, he's a member of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He's tried many, many cases. Uh, and then he uh, retired from that, and he is now teaching at Northwestern, both in the undergraduate uh, uh, world and also at the law school. Steve has a terrific blog. I commend it to you if you're not aware of it. It's called The Belly of the Beast. I think it is one of the most insightful sources of uh, uh, an analysis of law firm and law practice, uh, economics and culture and, uh, and life. Um, Steve also recently came out with a book called The Lawyer Bubble, A Profession in Crisis. I recommend it highly to you. If you go on Amazon, you may see my comments telling everybody what a great book it is. Uh, and you absolutely must read it. It's a must read for anybody thinking about going into the legal profession. Uh, and then also, we are very, very lucky to have Bob Dell here. Bob Dell is the longtime chair of uh, Latham & Watkins, one of the leading law firms one of the best of all the big law firms. Uh, he's managed uh, the uh, Latham firm uh, for almost 20 years now. Uh, Starry, you're probably one of the youngest managing partners of a large law firm, and uh, you're still at it. So his partners much, must have, and deservedly so, uh, enormous respect to keep reelecting him to the firm. The firm has 2,000 lawyers, 32 offices, and uh, 
Bob is, is widely recognized as one of the very best of all the chairs of all the big law firms. So we're going to hear from two analysts, and then Bob is going to be able to uh, give us his perspective on things. Then we're going to open it up to questions. And uh, please do ask questions. When you do, please come on down to the microphone so that this can all be recorded. So, Noah, we're going to start with you. and. Uh, I'd like to get it rolling with why, how did you pick big law as a topic with all the other things that you're uh, interested in? And uh, for those of you who have read the article, and those of you who haven't, you must read it. Um, how did you pick Mayor Brown as a uh, focus of it? Did you talk to other uh, lawyers at other law firms? Yeah, uh, all good questions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this conversation started internally at the New Republic. Um, you know, probably like it, it did in most places that were not law firms when uh, we started reading about Dewey's collapse. Um, and that prompted, uh, you know, um, uh, interesting internal conversations. A lot of us, um, the very few of us were actual lawyers. We have one lawyer on staff. Um, uh, we're sort of have all these kind of uh, uh, informal social connections to, to lawyers. Um, uh, I was joking to, uh, to some of the people we had dinner with last night that um, uh, when I went to Oxford, uh, some friends and I started a fantasy baseball league, and there are 10 people in the fantasy baseball league. Uh, I'm the only one of the 10 who's not a lawyer. Uh, so it was certainly part of my kind of sociological circle. Um, that was true for a lot of the editors and other writers on staff. Um, and so we immediately thought that this was a big story, um, not just for the legal world, but for you know, for for our world, for anyone who'd really um, you know graduated college, um, it, it's very likely that um, you know if, you, if you've graduated from a from a four year university, it's very likely that you've either um, thought about going to law school yourself, um, you uh, have friends who've gone to law school, um, you know you've taken the LSAT, you have family members. It, it, it just um, when I was talking to people with the piece, I would say that it, it, I think law school and the legal profession just punches vastly above its weight um, culturally. Um, you know, the, the way that it looms in the pop culture, um, um, you know, is far, um, um, you know, far greater than, uh, than its place in the economy. And uh, its place in the economy is not small, right? I mean, um, uh, lawyers are really important economically, but the, the amount of sort of cultural space and purchase that they have is, is far larger than that. So, um, so, so Dewey's collapse sort of prompted these conversations, and then it just became kind of, um, what was the way to get at it? What was the, the way that we could um, make this vivid and concrete for people who are not lawyers? Because uh, even though many of our readers are lawyers, many more are not. Um, and we'd like to think of, of ourselves as a general interest publication. So you know, in surveying what had been written about this, I noticed that um, you know, a lot of the coverage of Dewey and a lot of the stories that have been written, um, they tended to write um, uh, Primarily about kind of infighting in the you know in the sort of management suite you know um, uh, there was this power struggle you know these people defected these people um, stayed uh, and the power struggle you know ultimately resulted in um, e you know in problems that contributed to the collapse of the firm um, that seemed important um, clearly um, you know what the people at the top of the firm. Uh, uh, decide matters quite a bit um, for the future of the firm. But um, from 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 where we sat, what was more interesting was what was it doing, you know, to the daily lives of the thousands of people who work in firms who you know who aren't in in the boardroom, but you know um, they are smart, uh, respected people in their in their niches of of the legal world, um, and it, it just seemed like their lives were being affected by you know what was going on. Uh, in the profession, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of economic squeeze that was beginning to happen. So um, the, the gap seemed to be um, writing about it from a kind of a more um, a more ground level elevation, um, so that someone um, you know like me or like my colleagues could imagine. Um, you know, could, could have a sense of, of, of what their life might be like had they gone this, this direction. Or, you know, in, in many cases, uh, we probably have some undergraduates here, if they choose to go in, in this direction. So we, we felt like the gap was um, 
was was the altitude almost that um, a lot of these stories have been been written um, kind of at the at the, the, the executive suite level, but not uh, at the level of what life would be like for a kind of worker bee or for just an average partner. Um, as for Mayor Brown, um, it's interesting. Um, I started probably with a list of maybe a half a dozen firms, um, uh, all of whom seemed to sort of exhibit to some extent um, signs of stress, you know, um, firms that had gone through, um, you know, de-equitizations, um, firms that had expanded, you know, maybe more quickly than they were able to assimilate the acquisitions, um, firms that were, you know, extending the partnership track for associates, um, and there, there were just half a dozen sort of big changes um, uh, that were happening at big law firms. Steve writes about a lot of them in his book. And um, it, it just ended up being a process of elimination. Um, you know, the firm that had the most of those changes um, had undergone the most of those changes in, in a kind of manageable amount of time, 10 years or so, it seemed to be the firm that was most compelling to write about just because it would be the best window onto what was going on in the profession. And when I sort of, uh, you know, through that process of elimination, um, Mayor Brown ended, ended up as, as the last one standing. It had the most of these, it had undergone the most of these changes um, in, in kind of the least amount of time. Uh, and so it was just easiest as a narrative proposition to see, to see what was going on. But I, I, there were others that I came close to considering. I don't know if they'd appreciate my mentioning it, um, but uh, I, I, I did. Uh, Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I did, uh, I did uh, you know, start to investigate O'Melveny and Myers. Um, that, that that was um, that was probably the other finalist. You know, I'm sure they'd be very gratified to hear that. Um, uh, but um, you know, the, the other two subsidiary factors were one, um, uh, and this speaks well, Mayor Brown. They they, they just had a, a, a good reputation. The Supreme Court practice in in Washington, which is where I live, um, we were very large. Um, you know, one of the top Supreme Court and, and appellate practices. Um, so in the world, you know, that I knew well, um, they already had cachet. Um, and the other thing is, um, I was interested in, in a, in a Chicago-based firm um, because as I got into the history of the profession, Chicago had, for, for decades in the kind of early 20th century, had really been the kind of second city of the legal profession. You know, there was a, the New York model, the Cravath model, the White Shoe model, and um, the kind of elite Chicago firms, you know, they adopted parts of that model, but other parts, um, they did not, and in general, it, it made for a sort of more humane uh, atmosphere. So, if you were gonna, if you were gonna pick um, a, a set of, of, of firms that um, you know you would really be able to see the changes in the profession, it made sense to start um, from a place um, that was kind of most hospitable, uh, most inviting for a young lawyer, and and if um, the changes in the profession had made it substantially harder um, to be a lawyer in, in, in those places, then you could bet that it probably applied to the rest of the profession too. So Chicago was sort of an important factor as well. I should note that we extended an invitation to Mayor Brown to uh, come and be on our panel and uh, be involved, but they declined to do that. Um, all right, now let's, uh, thank you very much. Let's go to uh, Steve, and Steve, as you uh, uh, give us your perspective, um, Two things I'd like you to consider as well to comment on it. Uh, one is something we talked about last night. Which lawyers are the happiest lawyers that you've encountered? And perhaps who are not the happiest lawyers? And um, also, your thoughts about the American lawyer, uh, the AMLAW rankings, the AMLAW insights, and uh, financial information, what, what effect that may have on things? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this just because it's easier for me to. Uh, explain myself if I know all of you are looking at least in this general direction. Um, let me make three, three points though before I start. One, um, I come at all of this from a very positive place. I had a great career as a lawyer. If you're coming here expecting to hear somebody who's going to say, oh gee, I'm sorry to hear you're in law school or I'm sorry to hear you're thinking about going to law school, um, you're not going to hear it from me. I can't imagine anything else that I could have done that it would have been more fulfilling or rewarding or satisfying in terms of the way I, uh, way, the, the way my career went. Um, but the second point is it has, the, the environment and the, and the culture of most large firms uh, has changed dramatically. When I joined Kirkland and Ellis in 1978, I think I was the 150th lawyer. That wouldn't even be big enough to make the AMLAW 200, I think, today. Um, 
But the, but the, the other aspect of that, and this, Bob and I have been talking about this um, at, at some length, it's important not to paint with too broad a brush. So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, for a few minutes is what I, have, what I have observed, and that's really all it is. This is just one person's observations from 30 years inside these places and looking, inside one place actually, and looking at a lot, lots of others. Um, but, th but firms are different. The cultures are different, and I, and I have, and I'll do it publicly because I'm not afraid to do it at all. Um, I've commended Bob because I think his firm, Latham & Watkins, has in many important respects resisted some of the trends, the prevailing, what have become trends in the prevailing big law firm model, and I think it's taken a tremendous amount of strength and courage to pull that off. Um, and and the, uh, the last thing that I'll say is, uh, uh, that is not to say that the fact that I had a great career and, and had a great experience um, doing what I did, and I say I can't imagine doing anything else, doesn't mean that at some level it hasn't always been tough. Uh, being a lawyer is tough. It's, it, it's very rewarding, but it's, but it's a tough job. Um, I don't want to overstate it, but maybe I could give you this illustration. Um, I'm about, I don't know, 5'7", on a tall day. Um, when I joined Kirkland and Ellis in 1978, I was 6'2", and I weighed 185 pounds. Um, I titled this um, Everything You Wanted to Know About Big, Never Wanted to Know About Big Law, because of, part two, because a year ago I was here uh, and gave a, a, a talk on, on the same title, same topic, same title, same general topics. Some of you may have been here, and I'm assuming that consistent with the outstanding educational experience Stanford is for everyone who walks, walks around here, um, they're going to continue to make me come back until I get it right. So let's go with, uh, with what, what my observations have been about the great run that big law has had over the last 30 years. In 1985, there were the, the first ever, and this is to Bill's point on the American lawyer rankings, this was the first ever ranking of the, the AMLAW 50. There weren't 100, there weren't 200, there weren't 300 or 400. There was an AMLAW 50. It was Stephen Brill's brainchild, and he came up with this notion that what we ought to do is we, could, we got to get information out. It'll help people make better decisions, greater transparency, and it'll give people insight into what goes on in, in these relatively secret institutions. Um, 27 of them were based in New York, and the average profits per partner in these law firms was $300,000. That's about $650,000 in today's dollars. If you asked a senior partner in any of those firms today uh, what he would think about working for that amount of money, he would laugh in your face. But I will tell you those same senior partners, if you would ask them if they were sitting, when they were sitting where you're now sitting in law school, did you ever dream in a million years that you'd make $400,000 a year, they all would have signed, just tell me where to sign. Um, so where are we today? The, uh, the MLAW 50, which is the largest of the, of the firms, has 54,000 lawyers instead of 13,000. <clears> 12 of them are based in New York City. The others are all over the place. And the dollars have gotten extraordinary. Average partner profits exceed $1.6 million. The business model is simple. You start with billable hours. You increase hourly rates every year, year after year, as much as you can, and then you add leverage to the mix. Leverage, for those of you that are, are not familiar with it, is simply the ratio of the non-equity owner lawyers in a firm to the number of equity partners. So if you have the same number of associates as you have equity partners in what's called a single tier partnership, your leverage ratio is one. And so the metrics became similarly simple. In 1985, I will tell you, I don't know of a firm in the United States that had something called mandatory minimum billable hour requirements. That didn't mean you didn't know that there were firms that if you went to work there, you were going to have to work pretty hard, but they didn't have something that they would show up in a NALP directory and say, here is the minimum billable hour requirements for this firm. Firms in 1985 had relatively low hourly rates. Uh, that ate into profits, I'm sure, compared to what firms perhaps could have earned if they'd charged more, but those small cases, cases that I worked on, for example, allowed me to try a case as a second year associate, federal, two cases in, in federal court, jury trial, um, and those cases today would not have been able to sustain, the hourly rates would be too high to sustain those cases today. And the leverage ratio that I talked about a minute, a minute ago in 1985 uh, was 1.76. What's happened since? Now it's 
if you open up the NALP directory, almost every firm that you look at is gonna show a 1900 minimum uh, billable hour requirement. It has become, as we have imported the jargon of the, uh, of the business schools, it has become a metric by which we measure quote unquote productivity. Drives me crazy. If you s tell somebody that you would like them to paint your house, and he says to you, you know what, here's the deal. I don't know for sure how many hours it's gonna take me to paint your house, but I do know the longer it takes me, the more it's gonna cost. You would not say that that was a predict particularly productive person who was offering to paint your house, but that's what we in the legal profession have done. Hourly rate increases have been dramatic. Uh, they slowed a little bit during the recession, but they're still moving up um, and, and suggesting that at least at some level, uh, there's still a demand, a pretty good demand, for high-level services. And meanwhile, what's happened to leverage ratios, that is, the number of non-equity lawyers to the number of equity partners uh, that participate in the profits of the firm, it's doubled. Another way to look at that is it's become twice as hard to become an equity partner in a big firm as it was 30 years ago. What's behind that metrics, what's behind those metrics, um, are some other things that begin to influence the culture of these institutions. 80% of law firms in 1985 were single tier partnerships. That is, you made partner and then it was a different sort of contest, if you will, in terms of moving up within the partnership, but there wasn't a difference between uh, a salaried partner or a non-equity partner or an of counsel partner. Uh, you were, once you made it to partnership, you were a partner for all purposes. Um, typically, most firms, it was a seven to 10 year track, uh, and the internal spread within equity partnerships, that is the internal compensation spread within equity partnerships, was three to one, in some, fir some firms it was four to one. Um, I mentioned that to a couple of lawyers that I had dinner with last night, and they were astonished. They, they, couldn't, rem they couldn't imagine how, how could it have possibly been, been that low, but it was. Um, today, it's flipped, 80% of Law firms, big law firms today, have two-tier partnerships. Some of them have permanent equity partner uh, tracks, um, which means you're not really a partner. Um, there are fewer equity partners every year in most firms compared to prior years, and there's a decided preference for hiring laterally to bring equity partners into the firm as opposed to promoting from within. There have been recent studies that demonstrate that it's two or three times more likely to become, a, you're two or three times more likely to become an equity partner uh, if you're coming from the outside than if you're gonna be promoted from within. And the most stunning development for me in terms of influencing the culture of what institutions that continue to call themselves partnerships have experienced is this. The internal spread within equity partnerships has grown in many of these places to 20 to one. And here, I wanna, I, I wanna give credit where it's due because Bob Dell at Latham has resisted those sorts of, those sorts of tendencies. Um, at Dewey, uh, which Noam mentioned, was the springboard or the impetus or at least the, the beginning of the thought that led to his article. Uh, they called that, I guess they boasted about calling that the barbell approach to compensation. You have a handful of rainmakers on one side, and then a whole bunch more service partners, they call them, on the other side, and the result is a barbell. See, here's the thing about barbells. <laughs> um, the issue is, I think, that what, what has dominated the thought process that has led people to this model, and it's, as I say, it's a prevailing model, but it's not exclusive. There are exceptions, and the only thing, the, the piece of advice that I would give anybody seeking to enter a big law firm today or thinking about entering a big law firm today is take a close look at them. They're not the same. They are not the same. A number of them have very common features and that's why those are the prevailing trends that I like to talk about. Um, and among those common features is a preoccupation with, with near-term metrics to the exclusion, near-term performance to the exclusion of long-term values that it turns out matter at least as much in terms of the stability of the institution. It's a triumph of short-termism and the reason it's a triumph and the reason it persists is because it's lucrative for the people at the top, it's embedded, it's convenient, it's easy. Who can argue 
What's my compensation this year? Well, look at the numbers. I'm gonna look at your billings. There it is, end of story. It's also dangerous because not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. That, 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 this is attributed incorrectly often to something that was on, supposedly on Albert Einstein's chalkboard, but the actual author of those words was a sociologist named uh, William Bruce Cameron. But more to the point is, and really reinforcing the point, is Richard Susskind, who in his latest book essentially said, and you can read the quotation, um, the law firm leaders that he encounters, and this is from his current book, Tomorrow's Lawyers, are, have focused on a world where all that matters is the period of time that it takes them to get to retirement. And that, frankly, is simply not the definition of what should be leadership in what I think still is a noble profession. The cultural implications for people like you who are thinking about entering these places and for the people who are already there, I think are profound. In 30 years ago, the structures of the institutions rewarded partner-like behavior. There was an institutional focus. I had a senior partner say to me, look, back in the days when, when equity partner spread within my firm was about three, three to one or four to one, and he was capped at that three to one or four to one. And I was the one and he was the four. And he said, look, the only way I can make more money is by making you more productive. I gotta grow the pie. So that gave him an incentive to make me a better lawyer. And he did. And what, what came of that ultimately was an institution that had a collegiality to it and a connection to it and a loyalty to it, bonds of loyalty to it, that made lateral partner movement among these firms relatively rare. Today, it's all about short-term metrics. What are your billings? What are your billable hours? What's your leverage? This is on a lawyer by lawyer basis in many firms. In fact, I would even say in most firms. Um, what that causes partners to do is build client silos because they're only gonna get credit for what they can claim and hang on to credit for claiming. And that also creates a situation that actually exacerbates in, uh, instability because to, to, to describe what's happening in the lateral partner market now as a frenzy is frankly an understatement. Um, uh, and we could talk about that, that's a, a whole other topic, but the irony there is that for most of the lateral hiring that occurs, it, even, the partner, even the managing partners of law firms have acknowledged it rarely works out as a, as a financial matter, it's rarely a financial plus for the firms that do it. The best and the most profitable firms don't do very much of it. That isn't to say that a strategic lateral hire can't be a good thing, as I say to, uh, to Bill. One of, some of my best friends are lateral partners. Um, it can be great for the firm, it can be great for the people involved, but when the strategy, when the dominant strategy of a law firm is, look, I'm, a, I'm looking at flat demand, so what I'm gonna do is try to buy top line revenues by going out and hiring somebody else's, uh, some other partner, because he'll bring a book of business with him, I think it's flawed. Um, there is a transition underway in the profession on a number of these kinds of issues because of the stability, instability, I think, that is growing. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through all this, but this is the, this is the important part here is, is that when law firms were asked uh, a few months ago, managing partners of law firms were asked to tell us what are the priorities? What are your priorities for your law firm? This is the order in which they listed them. And the significance of the list is that you gotta get down to number eight before you get to client value. And you gotta get down to number 10 before you get to lawyer performance. Everything else is about growth, it's about new business, it's about short-term profitability, it's about all of the wrong things if what you're interested in is trying to create a noble profession or restore nobility to a, to a great profession. Um, the managing partners are also in a world of cognitive dissonance about a lot of this stuff. 30% of them say they're fearful that there aren't enough mid-level partners to take over as some of their older partners move on. Well, whose fault is that? Um, and 70% of them say, we have aging part I'm really concerned because we have aging partners who are hanging on too long. That's because they're making a lot of money. <laughs> so what are they doing? What are they doing about it? Well, they're reacting with a short-term myopia to it. 80% of managing partners say that what they're doing is tightening their standards for admission into equity partnership. These are the same people that are saying they're worried about the future in terms of their talent pool. And they're expanding the ranks of non-equity partners because those people are profit centers. You can charge high hourly rates, clients will resist a first year associate because they don't think he's worth anything, but a non-equity partner, not a problem. And the irony of course is that 
of managing partners in their firms in the most recent Altman Wildman survey said that their partners' morale had slipped since 2008. And these are people that have survived the de-equitizations, the purges, all this stuff. So all this is working for some people, but not for, not for, not for everybody or most of them. Uh, what's the downside? Associate attrition rate exceeds 80%. Every year, big firms are hiring 20, and 16 associates are losing their jobs. Um, associates are redefining satisfied as having any job. And I don't blame you. It's been a tough seven years, and you've lived through a, a terrible time. Partner morale, as I mentioned, is down. The billable hour regime continues to encourage inefficiency and cost clients money, and the inst institutional instability remains rampant, uh, as does continuity in many client relationships. But out of this grows opportunity. And the opportunity is, I think, from, comes from ultimately from all of you. Young lawyers want a reality that more closely matches their expectations. They want mentors. They want meaningful experiences. They want collegiality. Clients want things different too, many of them. Some of them are perfectly happy with the billable hour approach. Uh, others want their lawyers to take a more creative look at things. So where is this all gonna lead? I think it'll take us to a resurgence. You will lead the, you will lead the way if it happens. You people in this institution, the vast majority of you, if you're Stanford law students, will begin your careers in big law firms. Those are just the numbers. Um, and what, will, what you will demand, I think, by, your, by voting with your feet in different ways is the resurgence of positive culture. Um, I think informed clients are already beginning to understand the significance and importance of positive culture, even though it's a value that's difficult to measure. Um, I think smart firms will look at manual minimum billable hour requirements and say, why are we doing this exactly? Um, if, you, if, you need, if you need a minimum billable hour requirement to get somebody to actually work, hard on matters that they should be highly motivated to do, then maybe there's something missing in whatever it is you're doing to try to motivate them. Um, wise leaders will discourage the eat what you kill systems, and all of you uh, will make us better than we are. Um, because it will take all of you. It, it's not gonna happen from, from, in general, my demographic group. Um, and if you wanna know more, then read the book. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bob, you've heard some analyses of big law, and uh, we'd like to get your impressions, but in particular, if you could think about and talk about um, is law a business or profession, why have the changes occurred uh, that Steve and Noam have described over the last 30 years, um, and a sense of uh, stewardship. How do, do law firms have a sense of stewardship looking to maintain and improve the organization in the years to come, or are they as focused on the bottom line has been suggested? Well, I'll start with the last one since I can remember it, and you can remind me of the other two. <coughs> um, I do think stewardship is something that's of great concern for the best law firms. Um, and, and one of my issues with Noam's piece uh, was about categorizing all big law in a similar way, which you know, is, is, is uh, something we can come back to. But, um, I think at the better law firms, uh, there's a sense of what is the next generation. And, and something uh, that we've done at our firm for decades is try to identify the next leaders, uh, try to empower those leaders early on. And I, when I say leaders, I mean not just leaders of you know, a, a firm committee or whatever, but leaders of client relationships so that we, well before a, a partner retires, uh, the next group of partners in that client relationship are fully invested, the clients are ready to turn over the work fully to them. Um, and we've said this for years, we want to invest in our younger people because that's the future. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, especially with large institutions, they're very vulnerable. And um, you have uh, major client relationships at risk every year as partners retire. And of course, there's a baby boom generation going through uh, the whole world right now. Uh, and there will be a lot of retirements and you have to prepare for that. So I think, I think that's critical. But part of the leadership that I think is so critical, and I noticed on your list, Steve, of uh, priorities, one priority that wasn't even listed was uh, for a leader to, to be worried about or concerned about was preserving, enhancing the firm's culture. Uh, I, I mean, that was astounding to me that that wasn't even on Amazing, the list. Yeah. Um, but that's something that, in terms of building an institution that's a long-term institution that 
uh, you want to survive beyond your professional tenure, uh, you have to invest in your younger people, you have to empower them, you have to identify leaders who embrace a good culture. Um, and what, I, I mean, What's a good culture? Good culture is a culture where there isn't internal fighting, which uh, you know was one of the things you mentioned in your article, Noam, and I know that exists at a lot of law firms. Um, and, and that's created by incentives that are provided by the firm, by the leadership of, of the firm. So, for example, there are firms, and, and I don't know the inside of Mayor Brown, so I'm not going to comment on, on, on Mayor Brown, but there certainly are firms where the key indicator, the key performance indicator for a partner is simply what are your billings for clients you're responsible for. That's it. Now, one thing we've done to counter that is to say um, we will treat any client that you've brought in uh, and the billings attributable to that client as we're going to count that as important for you. But more importantly, we want you to bring other partners into that relationship. So any partner that you bring into that relationship is not going to hurt you. We're going to give a separate amount of revenue attributed to that partner, basically counting twice, to say that if you bring someone else to help you, to team with you, to promote teamwork, they're going to value. They're going to be valued for that. You're going to be not diminished for that, and and then you wrap around that an overall view of the firm and a culture of the firm that promotes teaming and working together collegially. Uh, you know, working together to attack the competition, to increase market share, not internally with each other, uh, and that comes from leadership and culture. Uh, and I think uh, you know one thing for people who are look, looking at getting into the profession. Uh, I think the firms that get that right going forward, uh, and I don't suggest we're the only firm that will, but the firms that get that right are going to be the firms that succeed even more in the future than in the past. And I say that because in the past, as Steve knows when we started practicing, most client relationships were a one partner relationship. It was usually one partner and maybe a few associates that worked with it to service that client. For the large client relationships these days, um, you can't do it with one partner. You can't do it effectively, and you certainly can't capitalize on the opportunities that way. We look at our largest clients, and there will be literally 30 partners involved in a client relationship. And we promote that. What's happening, what's changed in the profession is clients want that. Clients before kind of wanted their one person. And now, for the first time in the last several years, we are hearing from our major clients, large banks, large corporations, um, show us your team. And show us how, show us how well you, you work together. Show us how quickly you can assemble the talent for a major project. Show us that your lawyers in France work well with your lawyer, lawyers in San Diego and that they know each other and can, can work together just like that. So you have to build systems internally uh, and a culture internally that promotes that. So I think, and that's why I want to go back to yours, one of the things we do in terms of our strategic planning, in terms of strategic decisions we make, one of the first questions is, is this consistent with our culture? And that results in turning down business opportunities, lateral partners or teams of lateral partners, that may make a lot of sense from a pure business analysis. We're going to add $15 million worth of revenue, it's at the right rates, all these things. Um, but if we think the people aren't going to embrace our culture, we say no. And I'll give you an example because it was quite dramatic. Um, we decided uh, probably eight, six, seven, eight years ago that we wanted to add an office in Italy. And Whenever we had an office, we go, you know, do an analysis of the legal market there, try to find the best talent, you know, identify people, talk to lots of people, and then start, uh, you know, making it known that we're looking and, and maybe we hire a headhunter to help us. But we interview the talent. And Italy was a very interesting challenge because culturally, more than almost any country we've ever entered, the, the accepted culture in Italy was it, you had one or two, at the most, patriarchs at the top of a law firm. And they made every decision. They took 80% of the profits. And then they had, you know, 30 partners working in the firm with them. 
So we had approaches by several of these firms, and I would say to them, you know, you need to understand our culture. Here's how, you know, how it works. And I'd, I'd get to things like, you know, we have an associates committee that makes the recommendations to the partners about who should be admitted to the partnership. And we have 50% of that committee populated with associates. And the response I would get is, but it doesn't really work that way. You're telling me associates are helping make that decision? And I'd say yes. But they'd say, well, okay, but, but when we want to make a partner in the Italian office, I'm going to make that decision, right? Answer, no, that's not right. You're not going to make that decision. We went through that with firm after firm after firm and ultimately said, you know, we may not be able to find a way to open an office here because none of these firms can embrace this culture. They come from something so different that we're not going to be able to do it. Um, finally, we found a firm that we'd worked with, a, probably one of the best firms in Italy, and we said, we don't want the top person. We don't even want the second person or the third person. But there are three or four, I think it was four younger partners there, very high quality, who came to us and said, we think you're the future. We think the global firm is the future. Uh, we want, we're, we're very interested. We went through this cultural scenario with them, and they said, we love it. It's very different than, and, and frankly, you know, we, we, we bristled under the current culture in our firm. That's when we opened, but it took five years. I mean, we looked for five years. My only point is, if you don't put culture near the top of your list, um, and it has to be, you know, you have to go through financial consistency, all sorts of things. But if you don't put culture at the top of your list, um, I think you're, gonna, you're never going to succeed. You're never going to meet the possible expectations you have as a law firm. And I think that was true 20 years ago, but I think it's even more true today. Can, can I just make a point? Um, I, I largely agree with what you're saying about culture. Though I, I have a s sort of a Marxist take on this, which is that um, we are a Marxist uh, organization, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, which is, to some extent, culture is enabled by economic success, and these things can kind of reinforce each other. And I think one of the problems of Mayor Brown and problems a lot of firms is it's it's very tough to improve the culture and fix what's wrong with the culture in a time of economic stagnation. And just to take two very specific examples that you talk about, the client teams and incentivizing teamwork with, um, with the way um, lawyers are incentivized internally, um, Mayor Brown tried both of those things. Um, they built these big client teams, made a huge push for that, really uprooted you know, the whole structure of the organization to make it more team-centric. Problem was Mayor Brown did not have enough large institutional clients to sort of sustain all the partners on these on the on the most sought after teams. So what you ended up having was this sort of internal fighting and jockeying to elbow people off a team so you could get on a team because there were only a couple really lucrative sought after mm -hmm. teams within the firm. So if you didn't have enough of that large institutional business um, to sort of uh, feed all of your partners, then it, then it became uh, then it became a matter of jockeying for position. Even though uh, the motivation had been completely noble and constructive, um, on the incentivizing of teamwork, when it comes to sort of particular clients, um, you know, a lot of firms have these sort of credit systems. You know, you bring in a client, you get a, a client cr origination credit for it. Different firms call it different things, but basically, if you get a client. It is noted on some central ledger somewhere that you brought in this business. Uh, so Mayor Brown did a very similar thing. They, um, um, instead of you um, getting all of that 100% credit um, or having to share it with some, you know, it, the, the, the way it used to work was you get all the credit if you work on it entirely yourself or if you bring in some other partners, you suddenly get 50% credit because you've got to dole out 25% to one other person and 25% to another. So they said, well, that's crazy. Um, we should incentivize teamwork. Um, there's now up to 200% credit. The person who brings in the business can only get half of that 100%. And he can, you know, and the, the people who, who are on the team will get the rest of it so it's not a zero-sum thing. What ended up happening was, um, and I write about this in the piece, you ended up getting these kind of reciprocal back scratching arrangements where um, I bring in this business and you, you know, I'm a litigator and, and you're a, you know, a transactions guy, I just kick you the 100% um, because I know that when it comes time for you to, um, to dole out your 100%, you'll, you'll give it to me. And so you, you started getting all these reciprocal arrangements, again, because 
people just, there just wasn't enough big business to go around and people very quickly figured out how to game it. Um, so I think their, their impulses were completely sincere, but the, the kind of larger structural economic context in which we were, they were operating, which was just not enough large institutional business to go around, really ended up sort of skewing the incentives. No, I can see that. I th I've heard of stories like that. I, on the latter point about you know the sort of, I'll give you this credit, you'll give me that credit. I do think that's ultimately a leadership and a management issue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we've seen something where it didn't look quite right, and, and, and it's very easy, uh, you know, you can look people and see. People know, right? Yeah, <laughs> people know, and, and, and you look and see that. You go to that person and, and say, we don't think this is accurate. You tell us how this happened, and you stop it. But more importantly, you say, don't do that. And that's not, you're not going to succeed here if you do that. Um, well, you, let me stop yeah. there. So you say, don't do that. Right. It's easy to say, don't do that when that partner has $3 million worth of business. It's easy to say when that partner has $8 million worth of business. That partner has $30 million worth of business and is a bad citizen and acts badly, but has $30 million worth of business. It's a great example. What do you do? I'll tell you exactly what, because we've done it. The only way, if you, you have a partner like that and you go and say, you can't do this, that's not our system, yeah, et cetera, and, and somebody who's got $30 million, you say, you know, we're, you got, this is how you have to behave, does it again go back and say, we told you, you know, as a result, we're going to reduce your compensation. And if you do it again, you're not part of this law firm. And like Obama, <laughs> you, have to, you have to then take action, which is even one of the major business producers of the firm who can't in, embrace the culture, behave properly, has to be asked to leave. And we've done it on several, several occasions with numbers exactly as you indicated. And it sends a signal to the rest of the partnership that it, this is important. This is who we are. You know, we can take a, a revenue loss of $30 million to preserve our culture. Uh, to your point, Noam, um, you know, in, in tough economic times, it has to be more than the systems. There has to be uh, both a leadership impact and an overall culture that's been there for years. You know, we went in the early 90s through a horrendous situation where there was a None of you were probably born, but there was a, a, a massive recession. But we got hit particularly hard because our largest client at the time was Drexel Burnham. And Drexel was a big investment bank, you know, high-flying investment bank. We were, you know, doing unbelievable amounts of work for them, very <coughs> high quality work, very high, very high returns for the work, highly leveraged, I mean, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and Michael Milken was uh, determined to have been committed fraud and Drexel blew up. Gone, absolutely, on, you know, one day it's a thriving institution, the next day it's like, you know, Bernie Madoff, just gone. The same year, our second biggest client, which at the time was Hughes Aircraft, you might, I don't know if you remember this, was purchased by GM. GM said legal work is moving with Kirkland. Literally our second largest client, same year. Same year, our third largest client was KKR, which was a big uh, LBO firm. And they basically told us, we're not doing deals. You know, this, this is not an environment, you ought to just be your own planning. No, we're not gonna do a deal for two years. Three of the largest clients of the firm, gone overnight. Severe economic pressure, you know, desperation kind of situation. Partnership got together and said, we're gonna get through this. You know, here's a plan. We're gonna walk through it, it's gonna take some time. Um, one person left, and, and everyone else pulled together, not because we had the systems in place that helped, but because you had a culture already of you know, decades of people thinking this is an institution, we're part of an institution, we, we, we team together. So it's not an easy proposition. I don't suggest you just change some systems as Mayor Brown tried to do, apparently. Uh, you have to have you know, an overhanging culture and leadership enforcing that for a long time to make it, to make it work effectively. And, and one other thing, structurally, too, you, you ought to comment on this. You're not a typical, I guess I shouldn't say typical, you're not a, a prevailing model, eat what you kill kind of place either, right? I mean, the, there's a, some of the things that, you, that, that you guys have been talking about in terms of being able to move credit for business and all that sort of stuff, it has a lesser impact than it would in a, what I would call a traditional eat what you kill right, organization. Right, right. I mean, our, our, our compensation system 
is one that takes into consideration all sorts of contributions, and our partners understand that. And clearly, business production is a, a, a very important one, it's, and you're going to get paid a lot if you do well in that regard. But we've also come to understand that there are a lot of partners that contribute to that success, even though it's not so, there's no number on their page. I mean, there's just a lot of partners, and, also, and, and frankly, in the last decade, I'd say, the importance of those partners has become even greater because clients in this regulatory environment, for example, a lot of regulatory lawyers don't usually, aren't the ones that bring in massive amounts of business. But, uh, for example, in the bank regulatory area, a lot of those bank regulatory lawyers sort of, you know, were scurrying away and, and, or uh, uh, working in obscurity. I mean, it was a very niche -y kind of thing. Um, now our investment banking clients don't make a move without going to the bank regulatory people. Compliance is 95% of their time. So, you know, these are partners that are not bringing in this work, but they're very important, and we pay them based on that. And so there's a lot of soft contributions that get taken into consideration in a compensation system where you're not wedded to the numbers, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's some places have described it as a, a modified uh, lockstep. We, yeah, we, we have a modified lockstep, which means that. Fill that out a little bit. Yeah, more, just yeah. I mean, in essence, um, you start as a partner and you progress, you know, each year up to certain points. But the, the highest you can get is three times what the low what your starting compensation was. But then on top of that, to add incentives and 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 um, and motivate people. Uh, and, and for fair, fairness purposes, we take 15% of the profits of the firm into a fund, a bonus pool. And then at the, at the end of every year, we award bonuses to reflect what those partners did that year. So the reason for that is you could have a first year partner, and we've had this first, second year partner, you know, at a, a third of the top in terms of their unit compensation, but they had an unbelievable year. And they, did, they performed as well as our best partners. And so we use then the bonuses to give to even that out to make it a little bit more fair. So one of the points that Noam's article makes is that talking about bonuses and then special bonuses, and it's kind of like uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm: all partners are equal, but some partners are more equal than others. And um, what it struck me, and what came out from your article, Noam. Um, what's the glue? I mean, Bob and Steve and Noam. What's the glue? You talk about culture, Bob. There's got to be more to that culture, the glue, than money. So how, with all of the mergers and all the laterals, how do you connect that um, partner in uh, Milan or Abu Dhabi who does finance with the litigator in New York, with the IT lawyer in Silicon Valley, and the labor lawyer in LA? What, what's the glue? Well, I mean, the glue, first of all, we haven't done mergers. We've basically hired you know, one or two or three lawyers at a time. but. Number one is that screening process. Number one is saying, you understand our systems, you understand what we value, and you're going to succeed here based on what we value, not on some of these other metrics that other firms may have created. Um, and that, that teaming, the importance of, and they know that you, you will do better in our firm if you team with others. That, is, that really knits people together in a very significant way. And, and so, and, and if you have a set of systems where there's no barriers to that. In other words, the, the lawyer in Abu Dhabi, in, in a lot of law firms, they have profit centers. So that lawyer is going to be compensated based on the revenue of the Abu Dhabi office. Problem with that is that lawyer has no incentive to work on something with a lawyer in New York because it's not going into that profit stream. In our firm, we have one profit pools for all partners. And we say, you know, if you get a call, one of the things I tell our partners at, at almost every partners meeting is, um, you know, your, your partners are your most important clients. So if you get a call from a partner who you may not have met, the Abu Dhabi partner, um, you treat that partner like your best client. You say yes when they ask for help. That's an instilled part of the culture, and they see how it works in their favor. You know, they, they have to give, but they also take, you know, when they call, they know they're going to get the help they want. That's part of a culture that um, they understand it's, it's to their benefit. Um, and again, it has to be reinforced over and over and over, and you will have people who stray from it, but it's what you do with those people. 
You know, it's, it's, and, and I think the other thing is that the people who succeed, the role models, are people who embrace that culture. So the partnership sees, you know, wow, that person is doing really well. Well, what that person does is create opportunities for 15 younger partners, and they have a great team. And they, they get together, and they team together, and they work together. Um, that is what kind of knits it together and keeps it together. It's a, a combination of lots of things, but it's a fair compensation system. It's one that encourages teamwork. Um, and it's this, you know, I think the sledgehammer in, the, in all of this is if you don't really embrace this, you're not going to last in the firm. Why don't we um, take some questions now? We've got about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Come on down. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm a uh, current 2L here, and um, there's a, there was a, a lot of very interesting talk about how to create better relationships among partners, but I think what a lot of law students are concerned about is, well, what is our life going to be like when we're associates? And um, so I think um, a lot of us are still concerned about what happened at a lot of these, you know, at some of your firms, you know, post the financial crisis. And so what are firms doing to ensure that they've learned lessons from maybe their hiring practices of that era, and how can you continue to attract top talent uh, when there are these concerns about you know, job stability and the d diminishing prospects of making partner ultimately? I, I think Noam described life as an associate as soul crushing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Noam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, a, a couple comments. I, I think um, the, the post Lehman financial crisis was probably the worst economic hit law firms took in certainly my history. Um, and, and what it, and in our firm in particular, um, we again had the good fortune of being hit not only with a financial crisis, but two of our big clients were Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was a particularly tough time. And, um, and so we had, we went through a process of trying to decide what was going to preserve the health of, of the law firm for the long term. Uh, and that resulted in layoffs, which was painful as can be. Um, and it was obviously done with a lot of thought. And, and unfortunately, not unfortunately, we, we made a decision that, like the rest of our culture, we were going to be transparent about it. And so we literally announced what we were doing. Um, and, you know, got lots of press for it, um, and then watched other law firms do the same thing without making the announcements. And I looked at the the figures over that year, and essentially in the top 50 law firms, the average reduction in associates was 10 percent, which is what we did, and we were the only one that got all the attention. But in part, you know, we were large, so that was we were an easy target for that. But um, what you know, your question is, what are, what are we learning from that? Um, I think one thing we did learn was we let, and this goes to another one of Steve's points, we let our leverage creep up during those, and it wasn't just one year of, you know, successful activity. It was 2003, 4, 5, 6. The, the demands from our clients were so intense, we kept adding associates. And we got to almost 4 to 1. Historically, we had been 3 to 1. It was a very comfortable leverage ratio for us for a long time. We got to four to one, or almost 3.8 something. Um, and then the rug gets pulled out. So you ask yourself, should we ever respond to demand in that way? And we made a decision after that to say, you know, we just are very comfortable. We know we can weather ups and downs pretty well, maybe not a post Lehman thing again, but, but that's unlikely to occur. But we can weather things pretty well at three to one. Uh, we get to four to one. And we're just kind of asking for trouble. So what that said to us is we are going to maintain this ratio. Uh, we're going to turn down work. That's just part of you know, what, you, what you're accepting when you accept that kind of decision. So that's a decision we made. Um, I was telling Steve, is, is we've been through four years, five years of a recession. Uh, but there will be a recovery. <laughs> 
And it's been interesting to see, we're, we're seeing it already in some niche practice, not niches, but practice areas, different geographies where the demand has come back. And I was in London all last week in our office there, talking to a couple partners about our finance practice, and they were saying, you know, it's busy now, but next year is gonna be extremely busy. We just know given what needs to be refinanced in the marketplace and everything. Um, and we should start adding associates. And I said, you know, I think that's gonna be a very difficult decision because number one, we don't know for sure, but number two, you know, we're leveraged right now at about three to one. Um, we may well turn down some of that work. Um, and so, you know, you have to make, you have to learn, you have to make decisions based on, on, on what you've experienced in the past. Um, but I do think that's probably the single thing that law firms can do. And it's really one of the hardest things law firms deal with in terms of strategic planning is what is the right number of resources to have in a given practice area, in a given office, you know, for the long, for the long period of time. You have spikes, you have declines, and you know, the worst thing is when lawyers are not busy enough. The worst thing is when lawyers are way too busy. And that band is not that large. Uh, and it's also something unlike the supply of, you know, for a factory, you can't just turn up the supply. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for only the best talent, you can't say I'm gonna add 15 lawyers tomorrow. So it's a challenge and I think the best we can do is try to keep it at a ratio where we think it, it's been sensible for the longest period of time as opposed to one blip during a five year period. Yeah, I would just add one thing. I mean, if you, if you wanna look sort of at the entire segment, w one thing that's happening for sure is that big law firms are hiring fewer new associates out of law school. I mean, they just are. What I can't tell is whether they're treating the ones they hire any better. Um, I just don't know. You, you probably have friends who are maybe a little older than you who have a better sense of that than I would. And um, that's the test to me of whether they get it or not. I'll give you a perspective on that. And you can say yeah. I'm biased. <laughs> yeah. Because one of the things in your article, Noam, which I you know, took some issue with was the sort of paradise you portrayed life as an associate, you know, back, I don't know how many, 15, 20 years ago, um, when I was an associate. When, when I was 6'2". Yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, and honestly, I mean, I truly believe this. Their life as an associate today is a better, better professionally than it was back then, and I'll tell you why. Well, let me, let me make a major footnote. The likelihood of making a partner is low, period. So that's a big negative. Your opportunities, if you don't make partner, I think are actually quite a bit better than they were you know, when we were around. It, it was, there was a stigma attached to leaving a law firm as an associate, that just doesn't exist much anymore. Um, but life as an associate back then, this is mainly due to technology, was a lot of more drudgery. I mean, you, you know, I sat in warehouses in Phoenix for weeks, you know, going through boxes of documents. Um, it was terrible. Um, that's been uh, you know, essentially, not eliminated, but reduced dramatically b by technology. Training back then was the luck of the draw. If you happened to be working for a partner who was a good trainer, you were lucky. And uh, some of us were lucky and some of us weren't. Today, the better law firms have great training programs that are formal training programs. We invest a huge amount of money in training. And as a result, you, get, you can be assured of getting better training than you did 20 years ago. Um, another aspect, which I think is just a reality, is um, the diversity in our associate ranks compared to what it was you know, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, there was not a glass ceiling, there was a iron ceiling. I mean, it, 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 you know, women minorities in large law firms uh, just, they either weren't there or they weren't succeeding or both. And that's changed quite a bit. Not as much as we'd like it, but it's changed quite a bit. Um, and, and, you know, finally I'd say, I'm, I'm a big believer in pro bono, and 30 years ago, most large law firms didn't embrace it. And I would say today, most, not all, but most, not only embrace it, but promote it. And I think those are great, both professional opportunities and important in terms of the profession and what you give back. So lots of different things about being an associate today that, that I think are even better. We've got time for probably, we've got two more questions.
Thank you all for coming. Um, over the past, you know, several years, I think a lot of firms have just grown in size and scope a lot, you know, to the point where you have 23 offices in 15 countries, et cetera. Has that posed any kind of special challenges for you to maintain the kind of culture you're talking about? And how have you tried to, you know, counteract that so that it doesn't just become this, like, profit-seeking machine? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and it's, it's been a huge challenge. Um, one, one thing we've done is we've basically avoided large mergers all over. So we can sort of hand select the lawyers we think will embrace our culture. Um, another is just, I mean, this is kind of what I think I was sort of blocking and tackling. You do things to integrate those people into the, the life of the law firm. And it starts with you put people in new offices immediately on committees where they're dealing with people from all the other offices. You have um, regional and firm-wide in-person meetings, which we spend an enormous amount of money on, and, and I get questions from my partners, do we really need to be spending tens of millions of dollars on these meetings with all the technology today? We, you know, we talk to people on the phone, we have telepresence rooms in all our offices. The answer is, you know, the only way you connect with others ultimately is in person. The best way to do that is to work with somebody on a, on a project, uh, and so we promote that. It's the combination of those things that tie people together, um, and again, just the sort of expectation that we're one firm, we're one, one profit pool, uh, our associates are treated in a similar way across the firm, the training is the same across the firm. We bring our associates together, again, expensive proposition, and you wouldn't do it for the pure training purpose, but we have a summer academy, a first year academy, third year academy, fifth year academy, where we bring all the associates from all over the world together. And part of it is the training, but that's, in my mind, 20% of it. 80% of the reason is we want people feeling like they're part of one place. So it's a lot of different things, but you know, I think it's incredibly important. Some firms don't. Some firms want the silos. They just you know, want to add, add on this office, that office. Hope that office performs well. If it doesn't, get rid of it. Uh, if it does, great, everything's fine. Different model. I'm curious as to whether or not the partnership structure inherently creates problems, as Susskind has described. And one thing that comes to mind is where Goldman went public, and then there was a write-up in, I think it was the Harvard Business Journal, that describes the problems that that created. So short-term thinking is not necessarily inherent just in a partnership. It certainly happens all the time in Wall Street. Place. So I'm just curious about that. Thanks. Well, uh, I, would, I would say that what, what the short-term, short-termism, if I can coin a phrase, uh, that's, that's pervasive throughout the legal profession, except for Bob, um, and, I, and I, don't, I don't mean that jokingly. He, I mean, he, he is a, he, he is a, his, he and his firm are outside of the, I think, a, a very main way of viewing things, and I don't think it's at all limited to the legal profession. I think that kind of myopia is with all of us. That you know, part one of my book is law schools, and they've been suffering from a lot of the same problems. The short-term thinking that causes you to want to maximize your U.S. news rank for next year. Not this institution. The elite schools don't worry about that nonsense. But, but, but you know, drop down to the to the, and that's what's going on. And I just think it's everywhere, and it's uh, it's a real problem because the long, the values, long-term values that matter just as much. If you can't measure it, it doesn't count which is, I think, a mistake. Yeah. I mean, there's one trend that we haven't talked about, and I, I originally had a riff on it in my piece, and then I, it might have gotten marginalized to a footnote, but the, the sort of LLPization of the legal profession in, you know, went from the start in the 80s and then went through the 90s. Um, it was a real, I mean, it, was a, it, it seemed like a small technical thing at the time, but basically um, creating these limited liability partnerships, it, it just kind of accelerated um, you know, the sort of free agent aspect of it. You know, before the LLP model, um, you were on the hook for everything, right? Anyone you brought into your partnership for, you were essentially pledging your financial security on their integrity, right? Your, your, your mortgage, all your, your assets. If, if they got in trouble in some malpractice issue, you know, you were, you were liable in every way. Um, once the LLP model came about, um, that, you know, it, it, as, as, as the name suggests, it, it limited your liability, it insulated you from malpractice claims, those sorts of things. And it just became much easier, um, you know, for people 
um, to, to lateral in, you know, in, under the previous regime, you, you really wanted to promote associates from within because you wanted to get a, a seven, eight, ten year look at someone that you were going to be pledging all of your financial assets, you know, betting on them with. Um, but after the LP, um, the rise of the LP model, it suddenly became, you know, obviously you weren't going to be casual about it, but you, the, the insulation provided a, a measure of, um, uh, you know, of, 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 of risk, uh, it, it, it sort of de-risks um, the process of, of having people lateral in that, you know, you haven't done your full due diligence on. So I think that, that kind of exacerbated some of the problems that we're talking about. Um, and it really has completely overtaken the profession. I mean, I don't, um, I mean, maybe there are a couple of yeah, firms that aren't, but yeah, yeah. But I, I would say yeah. I, I wouldn't, I, I, it's not deterministic. It, I mean, you, no, you but because, it, but it, because it, yeah. basically you have to go through all your malpractice liability insurance before it becomes an issue, and, and right. most of the large right. firms have right. huge amounts of malpractice insurance. So I'm not sure that has a huge impact, but at the margins, yeah. Thank you. The, the other development, which is more, I think, more significant, is the, the emergence of the Swiss Verein. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, way of right. organizing, which, for right. those of you who don't know, it's basically a, a corporate or a partnership organization structure where you can create the silos and everyone's a separate entity and you don't share profits and all that. You're ultimately under a umbrella organization called a Swiss Verein. Uh, I think that makes people more distant from each other. And so I could have one more question, but can we take it down here? Because I think we've got to get the, the room vacated, right? So um, come on down, because we're going to hear it. Sure. And um, thank you very much. Thanks to our panelists.